Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Zhen Chen from Peking University. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have Professor Xiao Chen Mi here to give a lecture. Please allow me to briefly introduce him. Uh, Xiao Chen Mi is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Hofu University of Technology. He received his PhD degree at McGill University in 2018 under the supervision of Professor Higgins, uh, basically working on detonation in spatially homogeneous media. From 2018 to 2020, he was a postdoc at Cambridge University and worked on detonation of multi-phase energetic materials. Uh, then he did his second PhD uh, postdoc research at uh, McGill University again. He received the John Lee Young Investigator Award at the 27th DGAS meeting, actually at in Beijing. Uh, he is also an organizer of the Young Researchers Forum on Detonation and the first workshop on metal enabled cycle of renewable energy in 2022. So today he is going to talk about uh, combustion of ion powders. Uh, with that, Shashen, please, uh, I'll give you the floor to you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Chen, for your kind introduction. And also I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Huang Wei Zhang for the invitation. Uh, it is my great honor to join this uh, webinar and to present you my uh, and our colleagues' uh, recent research outcome on uh, iron powder combustion. So um, I will uh, first uh, give you the outline of my talk. Uh, I would like to address the three major points in this presentation. The first one I would like to talk about uh, why we study iron powder, why this is uh, um, an important topic. And the second, uh, I would like to talk about some unique features of iron powder combustion that is quite different from any other fuels, any other type of combustion, and why we need to understand these features uh, to really uh, promote and uh, develop iron powder combustion technologies. In the end, I would like to send out some invitations and also suggestions for the uh, excellent open foam combustion monitors. Uh, myself, I didn't have that much results using uh, open foam simulation yet, uh, but I think we are right now at a good position to pass on the physics that we have explored for iron powder combustion to the CFD modelers so that uh, in the future we can have more simulations uh, to study the flames of iron powder. Okay, I would like to first start with the motivation or why do we study this problem? Um, so it is clear to us that nowadays the energy crisis is not due to the lack of uh, renewable sources. Right, we do have a plenty of uh, renewable energy sources like solar, wind, and hydropower. But the real problem is these renewable energy sources are highly intermittent in time and also geographically scattered. But at the same time, the demand of energy consumption is continuous in both time and space. For example, we have more sunlight during the summertime but the high demand of uh, energy for heating is during winter time. And also there are more wind powers uh, near the sea, but uh, energy consumption is required everywhere uh, on the land, right? So the, this match uh, between supply and the demand in time and space for energy is the real problem of our nowadays energy crisis. So the solution is the following. We need good energy carriers for long-term storage and also long-distance transport of renewable energy. And now we talk about good energy carriers. So what are the criteria for these energy carriers to be good? We know that nowadays we want to replace uh, fossil fuels or, um, or any carbon-containing uh, energy carriers. So uh, we would like to first cross out carbon in the periodic table. And what are the other criteria? We do not want, uh, you know, we need something that can react with oxygen or water uh, very easily. 
So we do not want those who that, that react very slowly with oxygen or water, and we do not want those that are oxidizers themselves. So we block out some elements in the table. And uh, also we do not want something uh, too heavy. That's why we eliminated this the lower part of the periodic table because a heavy element would have a much lower energy density. And we do not want something to be rare since they are very expensive. Also, you no know, toxic, uh, toxicity. And also we do not want the reaction to happen too fast because if uh, the reaction is too fast, the combustion will be very uh, hard to be controlled, right? Then if we look at this table again, there are not many other options left there, right? So nowadays there is a lot of attention paid to hydrogen and the lithium, right? But these two options have their own drawbacks and there are some uh, certain scenarios. The first drawback about the hydrogen is, is low energy density. So in this uh, small cartoon right here, let me turn on my uh, laser pointer. So you can see this uh, cartoon shows that to contain the same amount of chemical energy, you need one tank of diesel. But to contain the same amount of energy, you may need five times more volume of compressed or liquefied hydrogen. Right. And if you are talking about the lithium ion battery, because it has to carry both the cathode, anode, and the electrolyte materials, the energy density is even lower. So to contain the same amount of energy, you need nearly 50 times more volumes than diesel. Um, and the other drawback of hydrogen is it has this uh, fire and explosion hazard. Right, Safety is the issue. And for batteries, it has also a very slow, uh, maybe 3% discharge rate per month. And this is okay or tolerable for your passenger car or your electronic devices, but this is not good for seasonal storage of energy because this uh, small percentage can accumulate over months. If you store energy during the summertime, you want to use that during the winter, a significant amount of energy will be lost. And that's why we are proposing this idea of metal enabled cycle of uh, renewable energy. And nowadays the most promising candidate for this metal fuel is iron powder. The idea is uh, relatively simple. So you can burn your iron powders, the combustion can release heat and this heat can be used to generate uh, electricity uh, or can be used just as the heat itself. The combustion doesn't release any CO2, so the exhaust is uh, relatively clean. And after the combustion, iron powders are converted to iron oxide powders, and these powders can be recycled and transported to somewhere you can have easy access to some renewable energy sources, like wind, solar, and hydropower. And this renewable energy input can electrolyze water to generate hydrogen. And use hydrogen, you can reduce iron oxide back to iron powder. So in this way, you input energy and it regenerate your iron powder fuel. The iron powder can be then transported back to where you need to consume the energy. And in such a way, you can recycle uh, the powder, the, the iron mass, and also transport and store uh, renewable energies for long distance and a long time, right? So you can see there is one uh, important point why we are choosing iron to be the candidate. It is because it has the high potential to be recycled nearly 100% after the combustion. So why this is the case? That's actually because iron has very high boiling point. So the boiling point is even higher than the combustion temperature of iron. And because of that, during the combustion phase, the iron powders do not evaporate or do not significantly evaporate, goes into the gas phase. So the iron powder uh, can be converted to iron oxide powder, which are still in condensed phase. 
you know, in liquid phase during the combustion, and then when they cool down, they will become solid powder. And you do not lose the mass of iron during the combustion. And also because of this unique uh, nature of iron combustion, we will see some unique uh, features of this problem. So as I said, iron has very high melting point and boiling point. So the combustion of iron particle is non-volatile. That means it doesn't evaporate that much and goes into the gas phase. This is quite different from some other metals like aluminum, magnesium, which has a relatively low melting point and a boiling point. So during their combustion, they evaporate and the, uh, most of the heat release is actually from the gas phase, right? And because of this non-volatile combustion nature, iron has the following two, in my opinion, the most important unique features that cannot be easily explained by our existing knowledge in combustion. The first one is the hydrogenous oxidation process. Since the particle remains in solid and liquid phase during the combustion, it interact or react with the uh, uh, oxidizer that is in gas phase. So this oxidation chemistry happens in heterogeneous phases. And the second, because of the non-volatile combustion, the energy release is uh, always first concentrated near the particle. And this makes the energy release over the space highly discrete, right? And this uh, discretized energy release can result in a flame behavior that is quite different from any gaseous flame or any volatile solid or liquid fuels. So I will talk about these unique features in the following slides. Let's start with the first one, hydrogenous oxidation rate, oxidation process. So iron combustion starts in solid phase because iron is stored in solid phase. If you want to uh, establish a flame, uh, the ignition must happen first in solid phase. So uh, the particle first undergo some preheating or self-heating due to heat release before it ignites, right? And during this process, the particle temperature is actually very close to the gas temperature surrounding it. And the oxygen diffusion from the gas to the particle is relatively fast comparing to the condensed phase kinetics. So at this relatively low temperature, the, ox the oxidation rate of the particle is limited by the condensed phase kinetics or the solid phase kinetics. And if certain conditions can be met, the particle will undergo thermal runaway, which means the energy release rate due to the kinetics exceeds the energy loss rate from the particle to the surrounding. And if that happens, the particle temperature increases up to the melting point. So it will transition to a liquid particle or molten droplet. And at this relatively high temperature, the internal kinetics becomes relatively fast. And then we hypothesize that uh, the external diffusion of oxygen from the surrounding gas to the particle surface may become the rate limiting factor, right? So during the liquid phase, then the external diffusion must be one of the important uh, process that determines the oxidation rate. And eventually the particle will burn out and uh, solidified. But since iron oxidation can happen at a different, at, at several stages, there might be some further oxidation up on this cooling process. So this is just a conceptual picture, but the, when we look into the literature, actually there is not uh, much direct information that we can use to build our iron particle reaction model. So we need to build our own physics-based reaction model for iron particle combustion for any other uh, uh, CFD simulations of, um, of flames. Right? First of all, we look at what happens in solid phase, you know, because the solid phase kinetics, as I said, determines the ignition behavior of the iron particle. So for solid phase, we can find some uh, literature from the metallurgy studies back in the 1950s. And they uh, demonstrated that if you have a, a 
iron plate or iron sample over time as it opposed to, to some surrounding uh, air at a certain temperature, there will be multiple layers of iron oxide build up. So this iron oxide layers has multiple uh, species. The top layer is the highest oxidized product, uh, which is Fe2O3 or hematite. And this is a very thin layer. Uh, this illustration is of the scale. So this layer is only uh, about 1% of the entire oxide fuel. And there is another like a four to 5% thickness of a uh, magnetite, which is Fe304. It's a relatively lower oxidized uh, product. And the most of this layer, 95% of the thickness uh, is of FeO or Woos type, which is the lowest oxidized product. So the rate of this uh, oxide, uh, oxide layer growth is controlled by the lattice diffusion of iron ions from the iron surface towards the iron gas, or, uh, the oxide gas surface, right? So this internal transport inside the solid lattice phase um, uh, iron oxide is the rate limiting factor, right? And this is not an experiment for particles. We just take this from the metallurgy study and assume this kinetics would also apply for this the tiny uh, micron or tens of micron size particles, right? And we can just uh, build a model by wrapping these layers around the particle and then apply the same kinetic rates to build our ignition model. So this, uh, the de details of this model can be found in this paper. And uh, we can just um, run this model. The model just consists of several equations of uh, conservation of uh, mass balance and heat balance. And uh, you can track the temperature of the particle uh, over time. And if the gas temperature of the surrounding environment is lower than some critical value, you can see that the particle temperature increases a little bit and eventually cools down back to the surrounding gas temperature. But if your temperature of the gas is greater than some critical value, for example, in this case, from 1,081 Kelvin to 1,082 Kelvin, you can observe that the temperature just keeps increasing, right? And this is the indication of thermal runaway, which means the energy release rate due to the oxidation exceeds the energy loss rate into the surrounding. And if we, we can find the minimum gas temperature Tg that can trigger thermal runaway, we consider this temperature to be the ignition temperature, right? And we can determine ignition temperature for different uh, parameters, and we can run this uh, simulation or this uh, model for uh, different particle sizes uh, to perform this parametric study. So here you see a picture uh, which shows the ignition temperature determined by this model as a function of a particle size. And the different lines indicate a different initial oxide layer thickness, right? And the, the thick lines are those with radiative heat loss and the thin lines are those without radiative heat loss. And you can see as the particle size increases uh, or larger than maybe 40 uh, micron, the ignition temperature almost the plateaus, right? Around uh, 1,080 to 1,100 Kelvin. Right? And as I said, there is no direct experimental measurement of this ignition temperature of particles, but there are some ignition temperature measurement for large samples, like millimeter sized samples out of iron foil uh, in the literature. You can see the prediction of iron particles is not very far away from this larger scale uh, samples, which uh, the difference can be uh, around 10% uh, or less. Uh, and also we know in this larger samples, uh, the sample is held uh, by some uh, solid uh, frames uh, and the sample can have some conductive heat loss into the frame. So that will result in uh, higher ignition temperature. 
But there's one important thing I would like to bring your attention to is um, this might be a little bit counterintuitive is the ignition temperature seems to be independent of oxygen concentration. If we consider this lattice diffusion of iron ions is the rate limiting factor, right? Because this diffusion is very slow, much slower than the collision frequency of oxygen molecules on the surface. Then as long as your oxygen in the gas is not zero or extremely low, then the growth rate of your oxide layer is not dependent on uh, oxygen concentration in the gas. So whether this is true or not, we really need some experimental verification because this, again, uh, this kinetic is uh, found from the solid phase uh, metallurgy studies, but not applied for any, um, nobody verified this for micron to tens of micron particles. Anyway, we do have something to start with, uh, but uh, to validate it, we need more experimental input. So after the ignition happens, the particle will transition into a molten droplet because the temperature of the particle will go above its melting point. So what happens in this uh, liquid, uh, liquid phase iron uh, or iron oxygen mixture is quite um, poorly known. You know, we do not know that much about its kinetics, but there are a number of uh, physics that we consider uh, or we hypothesize to be the rate limiting uh, factors. So this is the zoom in view. On this side is gas, and this is the surface of the liquid uh, iron and oxygen mixture droplet. So first of all, as I said before, in this liquid phase, very likely the external diffusion or transport of oxygen from the bulk gas to the iron particle surface is one of the limiting factor. The other thing is uh, the surface chemisorption, whether this amount of oxygen transported to the particle surface can be absorbed into the particle. This is also a question. And also internal transport, because this is in liquid phase, we know the internal transport are, uh, is faster, but whether this is uh, fast enough to be neglected to be the uh, uh, rate limiting factor or not, is not clear. And also the reaction between Fe and O ions that are dissociated into the particle. But we know that when they are dissociated, the reaction is actually very fast. So when the iron ion meets an oxygen ion, there's al almost no activation energy required for this reaction to happen. So we can maybe eliminate this process because we know that it's very fast. It probably won't limit the, the oxidation rate. So the question is whether external diffusion or external transport, surface chemisorption, internal transport uh, can be the rate limiting process, or it is an, a complex interplay among three of them. Right. And to answer this question, we cannot just do a theoretical modeling. You know, we need to have some anchor point from the experimental studies. And I will talk about two single particle combustion uh, experiments that have been uh, published in the literature. And these ones can be used for us to, uh, to, to validate our model and improve our understanding. The first one is done by a former uh, a PhD student at the TU Eindhoven, uh, Dao Wen Ning. He's right now a postdoc at TU Darmstadt in Germany. Uh, he performed this laser ignited particle burning experiments in air and at room temperature. So this is the top view of uh, this apparatus. So this is like a, a, a injector of the particles. In the middle, there's a hole, the particle is coming out of the page and uh, it can be ignited by the heating from a laser. And then the uh, combustion process can be captured by a high-speed camera. And also the temperature of the particle can be measured by two color parametry. This is one set of experiments. Another one is uh, 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 through a collaboration I had with uh, uh, Dr. 
Panahi uh, from uh, uh, Professor Levendis uh, group in the US in Northeastern uh, University in Boston. Uh, they have a drop tube and in this drop tube, the gas can be heated up to a very high temperature and you can also control the uh, composition of the gas. So the particle will be injected to the tube and the falling down in this uh, hot environment. And the particle temperature can also be uh, measured through a three color pyrometry that is looking from the top downwards towards the particle, right? And also the particle morphology can be captured with, via a, a high speed camera from the side, right? And these experiments do provide us some um, uh, a quantitative measurement of temperature of a particle uh, of iron particle during its combustion process. So let's talk about the, our model or what I call this early campaign of iron combustion model uh, uh, work. And in this early campaign, we uh, assume that internal transport is infinitely fast because it's at high temperature and also in liquid phase. And also in this liquid phase, we assume that the lowest oxidized product FeO is the only product. So that means there's no further oxidation beyond FeO. And the third assumption is 100% surface absorption of oxygen. That means all the oxygen molecules that strikes on the surface of the iron liquid particle can be absorbed into the particle. And the fourth assumption is the heat and the mass transfer from the particle through the boundary layer to the gas is considered in the continuum regime. So based on these relatively major assumptions, uh, two uh, independent studies have been done. This one on the left is uh, done by a PhD student at the TUE, uh, uh, Leon Tice. He uh, did a boundary layer resolved model, which is the 2D axisymmetric model that considers the detailed gas dynamics within the boundary layer of the particle. And uh, this solid line is his result uh, predicting the particle temperature as a function of time, right? And this is compared to uh, uh, Dao Guan Ning's uh, laser ignited particle experiments. So this uh, uh, dashed line is the experimental result and the, this gray shade is the error bar of the experimental result. So you can see that uh, the model matches the uh, experimental result qualitatively well and that overall combustion time is also well predicted at least up to the peak point. And this peak point is the burnout of iron. That means all the iron is converted to FeO. And also we consider FeO is the end of the reaction. So there is no further oxidation, right? And uh, another model is developed by uh, a student I supervised back at the McGill, Aki Fujinawa. And he developed this uh, 0D model, uh, which is uh, uh, less accurate than this boundary layer resolved the model because uh, you, you don't resolve the detailed uh, flows in the boundary. But still, the, uh, the overall trend is pretty, pretty well uh, matching with the um, experimental results. And uh, the temperature is a bit uh, overestimated, uh, maybe by 100 uh, Kelvin, but the overall time scale is more or less the same. But from both of these models, there is some uh, thing to remark. You can see the heating rates in the reaction part uh, before reaching the uh, uh, peak point are both over predicted compared to the experiments. And then the cooling will be too fast because after this peak point, which means FeO is fully formed, iron is uh, uh, consumed, there's no more oxidation happens. So this cooling is inert cooling, right? But if you look at the experimental results, the cooling is actually slower, right? Or the curve is the shallower, which indicates there might be some further oxidation happens uh, upon this cooling process. And this uh, hint or, or this uh, uh, hypothesis of uh, further oxidation is supported by some other experimental evidence. 
obtained by one of our collaborators, Lorraine Chazé, by performing material characterizations to some experimentally combusted iron oxide particles. So these are some particles that are uh, burnt from some uh, of the combustors at TUE, and they can perform this uh, cross-section uh, view uh, and uh, perform an electron uh, backscatter diffraction to look at uh, the distribution of different uh, crystalline structures across the cross-section. And the green uh, region is a magnetite, which is the Fe304, and the red region is the hematite, is the, is the Fe203. We know that both of these uh, oxides are further uh, oxide oxidized products than FeO, right? So, so it's very likely that our assumption uh, that uh, the, the reaction stops at the FeO is not correct. And also you see there's this big cavity within the particle, which indicates there must be some gas release upon the uh, cooling or the solidification of the of the particle. And this gas release um, suggests that there could be some uh, excess oxygen absorbed into the particle even more than the stoichiometry of Fe304 during the liquid phase. And when the particle resolidificate, re resolidifies, uh, it can be only stable uh, in one of these lattice form, like Fe304 is one of the lattice uh, or crystalline structure, and there, this, this excess amount of oxygen cannot be stored within the solid anymore, so it has to be expelled out of the particle. And both of these uh, two pieces of information indicate that the oxidation during the liquid phase is very likely beyond FeO, right? We shouldn't stop the oxidation there. So let's look back to our uh, model, this early campaign model. Uh, so if we look at uh, uh, our prediction for some even higher oxygen concentration cases for 50% oxygen and the other 50 is nitrogen or pure oxygen, the model prediction is, is much deviated from the experimental value, right? And this one is for sure problematic because it even goes up to the melting point or dissociation point of liquid FeO, which is not observed in the experiments. So there, that means there must be some missing physics there. So let's look back to our schematic of the possible physics that can play a role in this oxidation. Right? And before we considered external transport of oxygen, but we use the continuum model to model this process. But we know as the particle uh, temperature increases, the boundary layer temperature also increases. So the particle size might become comparable to the uh, free molecular mean free path uh, in the boundary layer, right? That means the continuum regime of heat mass transfer may not be applicable anymore to this scenario. And we may need to consider either uh, molecular uh, regime, free molecular regime heat transfer, or what we call this uh, Knudsen transition regime. And also this uh, surface chemisorption might not be 100%. There might be an accommodation limit. That means not all the oxygen that uh, uh, collide with the particle surface can be absorbed into the particle. And the reaction, uh, as I said, it must be very fast, but the experimental e evidence shows that there must be some oxidation beyond FeO. So we need to consider this a further oxidation. And also this internal transport might not be that fast. Maybe we need to consider a finite rate of internal transport. But instead of putting all this physics into the next version of the model, we decide to make some selection. We will put all these three uh, improvements uh, into the model while still assuming that the, the uh, internal transport rate is fast enough. Because to consider this, you definitely need a particle resolve the model, which is more complicated, right? If we want to use our 0D model to, uh, to, to capture the essential physics, we cannot 
easily consider this finite internal transport rate. And to consider this Knudsen regime of a mass and heat transfer, uh, a, a commonly used model from the literature is this the two layer model. And this is the recent work uh, that we uh, put on archive uh, by our PhD student, Leon Tice. And this uh, two layer model works in the following way. Uh, you consider this uh, inner layer. Inside this layer, you consider free molecular heat and mass transfer model. And outside this uh, layer, the outer uh, space, we consider uh, still the uh, uh, continuum regime of heat and mass transfer model. And this uh, Knudsen layer thickness is equal to the gas phase molecular mean free path, right, which can be calculated as a function of temperature of the boundary layer. And the mass and heat transfer rates uh, in this uh, free molecular regime are formulated quite differently from that of the continuum regime. And I would like to bring your attention to these two parameters uh, in these equations, uh, alpha m and alpha t. Alpha m is the mass accommodation coefficient, uh, which is the ratio between the absorbed oxygen into oxygen molecule into the particle uh, to the total amount of oxygen molecule colliding with the particle surface, right? So it, it does not not always equal to unity. And the other one is the thermal accommodation coefficient, which mean, uh, which is the ratio that measure the actual energy exchanged by a striking uh, molecule with the surface to the maximum uh, energy that can be exchanged between the surface and the gaseous uh, molecule. So, the values of these two accommodation coefficients for uh, for uh, oxygen and the nitrogen molecules with liquid iron oxide surface are not available in the literature. So what we can do about that is to use uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, to determine these uh, coefficients. Right. So this is just a sample uh, animation shows this type of. Uh, Simulation basically, you shoot a, a, a molecule. In this case, is an oxygen molecule towards this mixture of uh, iron and uh, and the oxygen uh, uh, atoms. Uh, and also, you can do this uh, for nitrogen molecule to determine their uh, the, the nitrogen molecules uh, thermal accommodation coefficient. And you can repeat these experiments or simulation many times with different uh, incident angles and speed uh, following the, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And the, based on the statistical data, you can measure what is the TAC and MAC of uh, both oxygen and the nitrogen molecules towards the surface. Right. So I will skip the detailed analysis of the result and just to show you that we use this accommodation coefficients informed by the MD simulation and the put back to the model, then we can consider the effect of heat and the mass transfer in the Knudsen transition regime, right? And also uh, we can consider the limits uh, due to the surface chemisorption or a non-unity mass accommodation coefficient. Also, we consider the oxidation can go beyond FeO, right? So taking these three improvements while still assuming uh, the internal transport is infinitely fast, we reach some new results. So this is, again, is compared to some relatively low oxygen concentration near uh, the case of air at a low temperature. Uh, the experimental result is this uh, uh, gray area, which is, uh, again, obtained by Dao Guanning from his laser ignited experiments. And the solid lines, um, this, this uh, uh, full solid line is uh, the newest uh, results considering all these uh, points. Also, uh, oxidation beyond FeO, that means the uh, uh, molar ratio ZO is beyond the 0 0.5. So you can see the overall trend matches with the experimental result even better. The, uh, the peak temperature and the, the, the overall time scale is uh, matching very well. However, if we look at the 
experimental results from this drop tube uh, experiments, especially those at the even higher oxygen concentrations, like 50 to nearly 100%, the model still significantly over predict the temperature reached by the particle. So this leads to our last thought about this missing physics, while well, we hope that is the last missing piece of the puzzle, uh, which is the internal transport, right? And that we do not have a very conclusive funding yet, uh, but we are doing some uh, work in progress uh, by performing simulations with a particle resolved model with MD simulation informed transport coefficients or diffusion coefficients. So this is just uh, some uh, work in progress, again, by a PhD student, Leon Tais, uh, showing that uh, if you have this um, uh, uh, internal uh, uh, distribution of Fe and O atoms, um, you can see a clear a gradient in terms of the O, uh, ZO, or the molar fraction of the uh, oxygen atom inside the particle. And this figure shows the internal velocity inside the particle because the particle can experience some uh, drag force applied by the flow around it and this uh, drag can can steer the flow inside a uh, particle and create some non-uniform flow field so both of this can give you a finite rate of transport uh, of uh, uh, fe and o atoms inside the particle so this is likely a, a key missing piece of puzzle. And we hope this will explain the discrepancy between our current model prediction with the high oxygen concentration experimental result. So although there are still some unknowns, then we have some physics-based model to move forward towards uh, flame uh, simulations because the model works okay for relatively low oxygen concentration and error cases, right? So this is the uh, roadmap of our uh, multi-scale multi-physics approach to model iron powder flame, right? So we use molecular dynamic simulations to determine this uh, surface accommodation coefficients. And also we can use that to, to determine the internal transport properties of Fe and O. And use this, uh, we can put the information into a single particle model. Right, we can keep improving the single particle model to make it a better and better match with the experimental results. And from the single particle model, we did analysis and it indicates that an interplay between or among external diffusion, surface absorption, and also internal transport is likely the case that controls the oxidation rate. And also within this single particle, we can uh, uh, implement uh, the accurate thermodynamic properties of all these species. So based on this single particle model, we can move on to flame simulations. But as you can see, the scale actually is quite large. Uh, it's quite uh, it's separated by a very large range, right? If you want to simulate some real combustion system, which on, is on the order of meters, then uh, there's a lot of uh, in intermediate physics we need to figure out. Right. And right now we are at this stage. We want to uh, implement the physics-based reaction model into some mesoscale DNS so that we can understand uh, how flame behaves in this uh, small scales. Uh, then we can develop some subgrade model for LES, and this LES can be used more efficiently for large-scale combustor simulation. So to uh, do this uh, uh, meso-resolved DNS, then this must be linked to the other feature I talked about, uh, about uh, iron powder combustion, which is this highly uh, discrete flame propagation behavior. So to understand this behavior, you can look at this uh, parameter, which compares the reaction time of each particle over which the particle releases its energy, and a characteristic time for interparticle heat diffusion, right? So if you have a very um, large chi parameter, which means the reaction is very slow comparing to the interparticle heat diffusion, the heat can be 
spring, uh, spread out uh, among the particles. So the resulting flame behavior uh, predicted by this uh, uh, heuristic model, uh, it looks very planar and smooth, which resembles some gaseous flame, gaseous laminar flame even. But if you have this chi parameter much less than one, that means the energy release from one particle is very fast and it takes time to diffuse from one particle to the other particle. So in this extreme case, you can see the resulting flame is very non-planar uh, and there is a lot of inter-particle features going on, right? So this, this picture is actually uh, very interesting. We do not know in real uh, iron flames uh, in which scenarios it burns, right? Maybe somewhere in between of these uh, two extreme uh, scenarios. But it's very important to keep this in mind because iron has this non-volatile combustion and it can give you a highly discrete flame behavior. So uh, more importantly is uh, this non-volatile combustion also interacts with the turbulent flow, right? Because in any realistic burners, eventually we're going to apply, uh, the, the iron particles must be burned within a turbulent flow, right? It cannot, we cannot just use a laminar flame for any applications. So this is a, just a sample picture of a student team at uh, uh, TU Eindhoven. Uh, they developed this uh, hybrid burner. I think there's still some methane flame in there, but they can stabilize a turbulent iron powder flame. So this is the, how the flame looks like. Um, and uh, uh, if we perform a, a simple dimensional analysis for a typical turbulent burner, uh, we can uh, get some in, uh, very interesting information about it. Uh, Nowadays, all the turbulent burner developers for iron combustion are some commercial or industrial uh, burners or some startup company. So they do not want to release all the uh, detailed quantities uh, to academia or publicly. Uh, so I cannot really use any dimension or relevant properties for any of this developed iron burner. So I just made a uh, thought experiments uh, let's take one of this Cambridge coal turbulent burner as an example. Just assume all the diameters and the flow quantities are similar to, uh, to, to an iron turbulent burner. Uh, and uh, we need to consider two sets of the length scales. The first the set is the set for turbulence itself. So uh, from this burner, we know that the inner uh, inner tube diameter is uh, around uh, 15.8 millimeter, and the mean injection speed of the flow is uh, nine meter per second. So this will result in a Reynolds number around 7,500. And for this Reynolds number, and considering the uh, 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 tube diameter, um, people estimated uh, the integral length is around 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter, and the coma growth length scale is around 100 microns, right? Because the turbulence is interacting with iron particles, so we also need to consider another set of length scales of iron dust. So the typical or the characteristic length scale of a particle is the particle size. Uh, we consider it's a 50 microns, which is quite relevant for the applications. And if we consider equivalence ratio of this 50 micron particles, uh, assuming FEO as the end product is one, uh, then uh, this will give us a mean particle spacing around 750 microns. So these are just some typical values. We, let's uh, see how this... Uh, Two sets of a term, uh, two sets of land scales compared to each other, and see what we can remark from there. So first of all, we can see that the particle size is less than the common growth of land scale. That means the particles tends to dissipate the turbulent kinetic energy via viscous graph with the gas, right? And uh, more interestingly, is the uh, mean particle spacing is actually between your Kolmogorov length scale and the integral length scale. That means the, the spatially discrete energy release 
which is characterized by the mean particle spacing, uh, falls in this energy production range in your turbulent energy spectrum. So uh, the, the, the spatial discrete energy release tends to produce turbulent kinetic energy. And another thing is about the Stokes number. So the Stokes number for uh, iron particles in this uh, flow, depending on uh, whether you are comparing to the Kolmogorov length scale or the integral length scale, it can range from 0 0.01 to 10. So uh, Stokes number, if you are not familiar with it, the, uh, the concept is, um, is basically a comparison between the uh, inertia of the particle to uh, how well it can be entrained by the gas. Right. So if you have a very small uh, Stokes number, that means the particle just to follow the gas uh, uh, very well. And if you have a very large Stokes number, uh, then the particle behaves more like a cannonball. So that it doesn't really uh, feel the gas flow because it has very large inertia. And what is interesting is if uh, the Stokes number is a wrong one, that means the inertia and uh, the flow uh, entrainment, they are on a comparable uh, level, then you can have this uh, preferential concentrations or clusterings of particles. And unfortunately, the iron uh, can uh, spread over Stokes numbers in this range that is, uh, uh, that is over one, you know, unit is somewhere in the middle. So we may expect uh, this uh, preferential concentration to happen in iron combustion. So this is uh, just a um, uh, particle laden flow study uh, by some numerical simulations shows uh, that if you have like a very slow, a very small Stokes number, like on this left column, then the particles just uh, follows the flow pattern. And if you have a very large Stokes number, then the iron particles, as I said, they just behave like uh, cannonballs. Uh, you know, the flow can move by itself and the particle are not much influenced by the flow. But what is interesting is when you have a Stokes number around one. So in this case, you can see the particles are concentrated into some region that has very high um, drain rate. And, and, uh, and in some other regions, the, there's no particles, right? So why this is important uh, for iron combustion? First of all, iron has a very high density and it likely can give you this large uh, uh, Stokes number range, right? And if this range covers Stokes number equals to unity, then you may end up having this uh, clustering or preferential concentration somewhere in your system. And another thing I would like to bring your attention back to this non-volatile combustion nature. You know, some other metals can also have this problem of a preferential concentration, but if they are volatile, that means initially they may end up having this uh, preferentially um, concentrated clusters, but they evaporate and eventually the heat release is from the gas phase and the gas phase can be more homogeneous. But unfortunately, iron is, uh, it has this non-volatile combustion. That means the particle remains in this condensed phase and experiencing this kind of a, a preferential concentration throughout its combustion process. And we need to care about this phenomena. Otherwise, we may uh, miscalculate the reaction rates of this flame. Right? And uh, what could be the effects of this uh, preferential concentration? Uh, the first one is can, it can uh, significantly change uh, the local particle number density. So a particle collision and, or even uh, agglomeration may happen in these regions. Although the average uh, particle volume fraction is quite low in these applications, it's uh, on the order of 10 to the minus four, but because of this uh, preferential concentration in these localized regions, the number density or the volume fraction can be quite high where your collision and agglomeration can become problem. And uh, this can also quite significantly change the local equivalence ratio. So if you have a more particle within some region, that means you are creating a, an overly rich region and the particle may quench, right? May not reach the, uh, uh, the full oxidation rate. So that's why this problem needs to be studied. 
And uh, a student, uh, a PhD student, Shyam Himamalini, uh, has done some preliminary study on this problem using uh, an anti-mix uh, chemical code. And this problem is also, uh, it can also be done with open form. I believe some of you uh, may have this expertise to implement this. Uh, so basically this is a mixing layer simulation. You have a, a, some cold uh, particle carried by air in the middle, and you have another counter uh, flowing layer, which contains uh, oxidizing gas at a much higher temperature. So this hotter gas can ignite the particles. And in this case, we are actually considering a very low Reynolds number, which itself should not give us any turbulent flow. But because of the particle energy release and also this uh, interparticle gradient, the, the, the discrete uh, effect, this actually triggers turbulence, right? You make the flow non-uniform. So this is very interesting phenomenon that we need to further investigate, right? And I think this uh, is about the, 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 the idea that what we have about a particle uh, reaction model, as I talked about in the first part, and also we show some uh, important problems that we can uh, use CFD to solve in this um, mesoscale DNS to understand how iron particle discrete combustion phenomena interact with the turbulence. Uh, but I believe the most uh, obvious methodology to use is this uh, euler lagrange uh, modeling approach with point-like particles, right? But there is some problem with this approach, uh, especially when we use this pro uh, when we use this methodology to study discrete combustion phenomena of iron. What is that? Is uh, uh, in most of the uh, you know examples of this type of approach applied for particle or droplet uh, combustion, we let the point particle to only interact with the local cell. Right. So this is called a particle centroid method or some other names called in different literatures. And your particle release heat and also uh, exchange momentum and mass in a certain rate. And when you impose this uh, influence into the gas, it is uh, spread out over a finite size computational cell volume. Right. So you need to, in, in, basically in your equation, uh, you have a division of the cell volume somewhere, right? And I believe by default in open foam, in this cold combustion foam, uh, the, the interaction between the particle and the gas is done in this way. So this is okay if your uh, volume of the cell is much larger than the particle spacing. That means you have a huge amount of uh, particles within the cell, then the, the, the effects are supposed to be averaged out. And this is quite uh, well, uh, uh, applied for those kind of uh, problems. But we know that if you, you make your cells smaller and smaller, and for the problem of uh, resolving discrete combustion, you may end up having cells contains no particle or cells contains only one particle. And in this case, uh, there, there are a number of problems. First of all, you over distribute uh, the influence of the particle to the gas. Because the particle heat release can only influence the surrounding of the particle. And, and you, if you let it influence a big box of the gas around it, you know, depending on your time scale, on your time st uh, step size, you may over influencing the gas around it. And also as you make the uh, cell size smaller and smaller, because in the gardening equation, you have this division of cell size, delta V, then you may end up having a divergence issue. Okay, so I, I just show you some example that I tried and I think I, I, I didn't, you know, continue that after seeing this divergent issue and I, I you know, uh, decided to look into the physics first, uh, but now I want to revisit this problem. Uh, it's like why I used open foam with this uh, 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 particle centroid method, uh, to resolve some discrete effect, that means like for a particle spacing around 120 micron, I need the grid size to be even smaller than the particle spacing to resolve the discrete effect. 
right? So you need to resolve this uh, interparticle gradient. And even before I get to that small uh, uh, grade size, we can already see some divergence. So these figures shows the temperature of both gas and the particle over space, over the front of the flame. And you can see that as I decrease the cell size from 200 micron to 100 micron. So this cell size is not much less than the uh, mean particle spacing. It's not even sufficient to uh, resolve the discrete effect. We can already see that the particle temperature uh, differs quite a lot from the particle temperature with a larger uh, cell size, right? So this is the problem. And to remedy this, this problem, we can use this so-called distribution kernel. First of all, we should avoid over distribute uh, the influence of a particle uh, to the gas. And uh, because the time step is usually limited by the CFL or the Fourier condition, then the simple solution would be just, uh, you know, you just make your cell size equals to the particle size. So you know that over this the delta T, the influence should be overspread over the space. Right. But this may not work if you have a poly dispersed particles. That means you have a large range of particle sizes. You can choose your dx to be equal to the minimum particle size in your system. But if you use the same uh, particle, uh, the same uh, grid size to resolve your large particles, you may end up having this uh, uh, localized uh, or divergence issue for these large particles again, because you are. Uh, artificially concentrate the influence of a bigger particle into a very small area, right? So the better way of doing that is to introduce a kernel that is uh, equal to the particle size, depending on what particle size it is in this poly dispersed system. And you can do this in different ways. You can distribute uh, the influence uniformly over this uh, uh, grid. And also you can introduce a Gaussian distribution to remedy the problem. So if you can apply this kind of a methodologies, depending on the particle size, we can uh, avoid the over distribution problem and also avoid uh, the numerical divergence. Okay, so I will move a bit faster here. Uh, so we know that uh, th this is the summary of some outstanding problems, not only for simulation, uh, not only for the modelers, but for the entire uh, iron powder combustion community. Uh, as I said, the ignition of the single particles uh, still lacks some experimental verification. So we need to determine ignition temperatures for single or dispersed cloud of iron particles to further validate our uh, solid phase kinetics. And, uh, um, and what is important is just to more accurately predict uh, or estimate the energy release rate of iron particles at different oxidation stages. Right? Heterogeneous oxidation mechanisms need to be further uh, 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 understood. And also this uh, non-uniform or discrete combustion phenomena interacting with turbulence uh, has to be modeled. I think this is a good point for the uh, open foam community to come in to tackle this problem together. And also uh, radiative heat transfer from the particle to particles, uh, and also from the particle to the surrounding, to your heat exchanging system. These are very important problems for the realistic burners because the, the, the heat exchange is through, what well, is significantly is through the radiative heat transfer from the particle to the, to the uh, uh, chamber wall of the combustor. And also, there might be some gas phase chemistry going on as well because the uh, iron particle can evaporate a little bit into a gas phase, which can be further oxidized and then forming all these nanoparticles, which is bad for, for human. Uh, you don't want to breathe that into your lungs. And also that would be a loss of iron mass within this cycle. So we want to understand this process to minimize uh, uh, the mass loss. And also because the temperature is high, especially in the boundary layer of the particle, uh, NOx is always a problem if you are burning them in the air. So we also want to understand the nitrogen chemistry with some iron species involved, right? And as I said, these two points are the, the problems I 
would like to invite uh, the uh, uh, open forum community to uh, to join us to collaborate and to tackle them together and uh, to experiment uh, to model some experiments i think the very interesting or the canonical system is this pervaves uh, experiments uh, it's called the percolating diffusion reaction waves and it's done in, on a sounding rocket under microgravity conditions and uh, uh, you can see these tubes that they can disperse ion particle mixed with some low thermal conductivity gas to uh, uh, to enhance the discrete effect so these experiments are done to study or get the uh, direct experimental evidence of discrete flame propagation and these are uh, obtained from some previous campaigns of the Pervaves experiments. And in two weeks, there will be another launch of this sounding rocket in Sweden at the s Range Space Center by ESA. And uh, uh, I, I have the honor to be there to watch the launch of this experiment. And uh, hopefully we will get more quantitative data from these experiments uh, for the modelers to do the simulation, right? And here I would like to thank all the students, collaborators, and also my mentors over the years uh, to, uh, to first introduce me to this uh, um, iron or metal combustion problem. And also together we made uh, some, I would say still early stage uh, contributions, but we believe that we set a good uh, foundation for the further CFB simulations to proceed, right? And uh, you're very welcome to join our team. I think uh, uh, later this year, we will have some postdoc uh, positions open up, not only for combustion, but also for the reduction using hydrogen to reduce iron oxide. And uh, hopefully in the coming year, there will be more positions. And if you are interested, uh, please reach out to me. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm very delighted to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Shachan. Thank you for giving the very nice overview about the issues related to the ion powder's combustion. So now the podium is open for questions. Uh, actually, we have first have some question from the panelists. Uh, maybe sure. the yeah. panelists can open your just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Maybe Professor Michael Kiefzner, can you can you go ahead? Yeah. Um... I, I was uh, working on boron combustion years ago, and, uh, oh, and there, yeah. there is a similar um, effect that first uh, you, you form this oxide layer, which yeah. however then evaporates off. So uh, I was just interested in uh, how are the melting points of the different oxides, and mm -hmm. would they mix uh, through the fusion, or would they be solid? Right, actually, that's an interesting question. I also had some uh, early experiments with uh, with boron uh, uh, combustion. Uh, this is a little bit different from boron. So, uh, so the melting point of FeO, which is the thickest layer of uh, of this uh, uh, oxide, uh, is even lower than iron's melting point. I think it's uh, around FeO melting point is uh, sixteen hundred fifty K, and the uh, iron is. Uh, uh, 17 or 1800 K. Um, so, so they will all melt and eventually, uh, you know, merge into a, a molten uh, sphere. But there is still some uh, unclear uh, physics going on there. Like we do not know that once they melt, they will become like a homogeneous the mixture or like still in a, in a, in a core shell structure. Uh, so from some metrology um, equilibrium calculation, people are saying that the liquid oxide uh, of iron and the liquid iron, they, are, they should be immiscible. So, so we may inside this immiscibility gap, uh, these two should not mix. But whether this is true or not uh, for this uh, very fast combustion of iron, which might not be at equilibrium, uh, this still requires some further, uh, further uh, investigation. So uh, yeah, so they do not evaporate during or, or completely uh, uh, evaporate uh, during the ignition process because the the boiling point of uh, both iron and iron oxide FeO uh, are, are very high. They are all nearly uh, uh, three thousand two hundred and uh, sorry uh, twenty nine hundred to three thousand or even above. 
so uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's our current understanding about the phase change. Yeah. So that means that uh, if you have this oxygen liquid layer, o oxygen uh, FAO mm -hmm. liquid layer, the oxygen mm -hmm. first has to to diffuse through the layer before it can then oxidize further the uh, iron inside of the particle. Is that right? Yeah. Well, actually, the, in the when you have a liquid oxide layer and a solid particle, that actually only happens over like a very short range of temperature. Maybe uh, you know, also very short of, uh, amount of time. But for solid phase, we know it is the uh, iron ions diffuse outward and they meet up with the oxygen near the surface, near ah, the interface. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, this is actually because uh, this is only true for solid phase uh, because uh, iron ion actually is bigger because it's gaining two electrons and the lattice of the iron oxides uh, like FeO and Fe3O4 has much smaller space for them to squeeze through. So iron actually are, are skinnier so it can be more easily uh, be, be more mobile through these layers and the, from the metallurgy studies the, uh, this seems to be the the mechanism and only in this very thin layer on top of this uh, uh, iron oxide uh, scale, you have this uh, bidirectional diffusion between both of these uh, these two species. Yeah. And for for liquid phase, the picture is not that clear. I mean, we have some hypotheses, but uh, there is no not yet any uh, experimental evidence to support our hypotheses. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting yeah, thank you. talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Xiao Chen. So the next question, I think, is from Professor Yi Hua Ren. Yeah, Professor Ren, please go ahead. I can not hear you, Professor Ren. Professor Ren, can, can you go ahead? Maybe you should have typed your question. I cannot hear you. Yeah, maybe we move on to the second question, uh, the next question from the Q&A. Uh, the question is from Hong Chao Chu. Uh, mm -hmm. he, his or her question is, uh, in the direct numeric simulations, are the particles resolved or described as the uh, Lagrange particles? Mm -hmm. Considering the Considering that the particle could be larger than the chromogroup scale, maybe like a larger particle assumption is not valid. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, we uh, right now, like we we think for uh, based on some estimation, we think the particle size should be less than the chromogroup uh, length scale. But the, well, if we go to larger burners uh, or experiencing an even higher Reynolds number, then the separation between your uh, uh, integral length scale to the Komogor length scale can be larger, then we may end up in a region that particle size is uh, comparable or even larger than the Komogor length scale. But so far, I don't really think that would be the case because the particle is really tiny. It's uh, from microns to maybe 50 microns maximum. Um, and in the numerical simulation, we do consider, uh, we do consider a, a point particle. Uh, it's only in some single particle analysis we do particle resolve the model, right? If you move on to CFD, it's a little bit hard to to use this, um, you know, particle phase uh, DNS. That would be, um, you know, computationally too expensive. But uh, we also experienced that there might be some non-uniform flow fields uh, around the particle, especially when your particle has a slip velocity uh, to the gas. Right, that the particles are not well entrained by the gas, then you you have some asymmetric flow field that can influence on your uh, uh, heat and mass transfer and also momentum drag. Right, so so this, well, my opinion is like if we can do that through correlations, through uh, you know doing some single or multiple particles, small scale si simulation, and then we develop some subgrid model or correlations. And then we pass on to this uh, larger scale simulations. 
that is more likely, I think it's more reasonable way to go rather than, you know, performing particle resolve simulations, you know, that's just, I, I think just uh, computationally infeasible to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the next question is from Dao Guan Ning. Yeah. The question uh, is, can React's, X, React's FF MD yeah. simulation provide insights into the solid phase oxidation mechanism of ion? Yeah, I think it can, uh, but right now it's, uh, we, we need to, uh, first of all, further, uh, uh, you know, uh, validate uh, this uh, React's XF or the React's reactive uh, force field for iron with oxygen. Uh, and also for solid phase, you know, is, is, you know, it's just not very clear, like what happens uh, to the particle at its initial condition. Like whether you do have this compact layer of oxide covering the particle uh, from the beginning, right? When your your particle is injected to a burner or in the, you know, or in Dalguan's experiments in this laser, right? Whether it has already a compact layer or not, that can differ uh, the, the the kinetics quite a lot. If you have an oxygen striking on a non fully covered surface, then Oxygen concentration may play a role, and and the, you know the, the 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 kinetics can be quite different from what I described here. So what I described is more is mainly based on the assumption that these layers are compact and the fully covered particle. So so to know that I think mm, yeah we can do some MD simulation to study, but but I think experimental results, especially material characterizations for these particles. Uh, would you know uh, be more insightful than MD simulation, or maybe we should do all this <laughs> together to to uh, to further to really clarify on this point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Xiaoqian. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the next question is about uh, MAC and the TAC calculation. Uh -huh. uh, the question is, uh, I'm not sure whether I understand it correctly. You carried out MD simulation so as to figure out the kinetics of heterogeneous surface reaction path. Then you can mm -hmm. combine both the diffusion and the surface chemistry to calculate the oxidation rate. Uh, well, I, yeah, this the word kinetics. I think is a little bit tricky. Like, what would we actually mean by that? Uh, I try to uh, somehow avoid using that term when we talk about the detailed physics. So, uh, so far what you have seen is, uh, uh, you know, we use the M uh, MD simulation to determine this uh, surface absorption or the heat transfer uh, phenomena, which we gives us the MAC and TAC. So MAC is uh, influencing the uh, oxidation rate and the TAC is more, uh, influencing the heat transfer rate between the particle and the gas and in this uh, Knudsen transition regime, right? So we do not get a, um, you know, a, a rate that like, like a function, you know, it's just like you have this MAC as a function of uh, uh, your, your uh, uh, oxygen concentration in the particle and also temperature. And once you have this, then you can calculate uh, the, the mass transport rate from the gas through this uh, Knudsen layer to the particle surface. And then you determine the oxidation rate based on the interplay between the absorption limit and uh, the transport rate. It's kind of similar to the, the previous models, or, or I would say this kind of a, a conceptual models, which is not that realistic is that they assume that something called the surface reaction rate, which depends on the oxygen concentration in the gas, and also you have an external diffusion rate. So it's still in this uh, framework. You have a, something happens on the surface and something happens to transport oxygen to the surface. But I would not call it uh, just kinetics because I think that's a little bit too vague. Uh, yes. I think you are right. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. You say uh, that I combine both the diffusion and the surface chemistry. Yeah, so it's an interplay between the external diffusion and the surface chemistry. And then this uh, determines the oxidation rate. 
Yeah, I think your understanding is correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chachim. Yeah. Uh, due to the time limit, maybe we have the last question uh, from Professor Yi Hua Ren. His sure. question is that, uh, is there a micro explosion phenomenon yeah. in ion particle combustion like uh, that in much component droplets? Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, in iron particle experimentally, we do see that uh, from, from you know, Dao Guan's uh, experiments and also some other uh, groups uh, from uh, Lundi University, uh, there are some experiments and also uh, uh, back at McGill at a very early time, they also see this. Um, but this explosion, our uh, understanding or somehow proved by experiments is due to the impurities inside the particle. Even you have a very little amount, like 0.1% of, a, say, carbon or, 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 or a sulfur there, and this this species can be oxidized and generate gas phase uh, uh, product. And this gas uh, can, you know, even the, the mass is very small, uh, but the, the volume of the gas, the density is low, and the, the volume of this uh, gas phase product can shatter the particle. Right. So if we have very high purity iron, this uh, micro explosion phenomena is uh, is really rare. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you. due to the time limitation, I have we have to stop. We have to stop here. If you have more questions, please feel free to contact Professor Mi. Uh, thank you for your participation. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Xiao Chen, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, maybe thank the panelists uh, open the uh, camera and. Uh, just say hello to Xiao Chen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank all you. very much. Yeah. For your, okay. Yeah, Xiao Chen. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Your, thank you. Your interest. Yeah. yeah Hope okay. to talk to you in the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Professor, for your hosting this yeah. talk. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.